Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Linda, and I'm here today to talk to you all about language justice in healthcare. So I'm curious to know if any of you guys have tried learning a new language, whether it's in a language class or trying to pick up some new vocab for a trip abroad. I think everyone can agree that learning a new language is exciting, it's rewarding, and it's sometimes scary. When I started French immersion in elementary, I had my fair share of embarrassing language hiccups. I can still remember the first time giving a presentation in front of the class. When I ended the presentation, instead of saying merci beaucoup, which means thank you very much, I said merci beaucoup, which means thank you, nice ass. <laughs> when my teacher called me out in front of the whole entire class, 12-year-old me was completely mortified. But I lived and I tell this tale to you all today. Language barriers and miscommunication are often unexpected hiccups. They might be a little embarrassing, but nevertheless a great story. But what happens when language barriers extend beyond the immediate classroom or the tourist destination and turn into an everyday encounter that impacts your fundamental autonomy, your voice, and your rights. As the daughter of immigrants, language barriers were ubiquitous in everyday life and particularly frustrating in the context of healthcare, where miscommunication jeopardized the timely and the culturally safe delivery of healthcare services. My family soon realized that we were not alone, as our experiences represented the many struggles immigrants face in the healthcare system. It started with a visit from our neighbor who required a doctor's appointment for her stomach pain. Discovering that her family doctor didn't speak her native language in Mandarin, she sought help from my mother, whose medical background in gastroenterology enabled her to take a medical history. Using a Chinese to English dictionary, she was able to translate her symptoms and write them down into English. So when our neighbor met her doctor, rather than simply reporting a pain in the stomach, she was able to characterize her pain as sharp and as sudden. Its precise location in the lower right side of the abdomen and how the pain was aggravated by coughing. These keywords provided the physician with greater insight into the possible causes of her pain. She was promptly referred for blood work and diagnosed with acute appendicitis, a condition in which left untreated can lead to a ruptured appendix, potentially causing life-threatening infections. Slowly, the news of my mother's competencies in healthcare translation spread, and one by one, our neighbors started trickling in for help. Our home became a gathering place where newcomers sought advice and support for all things healthcare. I vividly remember nights when friends, neighbors, and neighbors who became friends gathered around our dining room table, sharing their concerns about their individual health challenges and the cultural, linguistic, and financial barriers to obtaining good health. Many felt as if they were being overlooked by the healthcare system and that they were seeping through the cracks. It's well known that Canada prides itself on diversity and multiculturalism. Each year, more than 300,000 immigrants find their homes in Canada. And last year, Canada welcomed a record number of new immigrants. However, language barriers remain a significant obstacle that compromises the health and well-being of newcomers. To illustrate, a study from Statistics Canada shows that the prevalence of poor self-reported health significantly rose among immigrants with low English language proficiency, while this increase was diminished among those with good English language proficiency. So in the span of their first four years in Canada, poor self-reported health among immigrants with low English language proficiency rose from 5% to 12% among men and 8% to 21% among women. 
This increase was significantly reduced among immigrants with good English language proficiency from 2% to 4% among men and 2 to 7% among women. So if you were to take away anything from the previous two slides, low English language proficiency is significantly associated with a reported health decline among immigrants. So while Canada's universal health care system ensures equal access to health care for all, equal access to health care doesn't guarantee equitable health outcomes. Inequitable access arises from the failure to recognize that health is not only biomedical, it's also very social. Health is shaped by a myriad of interlocking socio-cultural factors such as education, economic stability, community context, and healthcare access. These factors are collectively termed the social determinants of health. Within the past decade, there's been an exponential increase in the literature on the social determinants of health, and we've only begun to realize that health and well-being are inextricably linked to these socio-cultural factors. However, without good and effective communication, these social determinants of health risk being left invisible to healthcare providers. Language justice is an individual's fundamental language right. To be able to communicate, understand, and be understood in the language they feel most articulate and powerful. In the healthcare realm, language can act as a tool of oppression by silencing voices that are underrepresented. Or it can act as a tool for empowerment through amplifying these underrepresented voices. My mother is a champion for language justice in our community. By bridging language gaps, she helped healthcare professionals gain a deeper and more nuanced understanding of a patient's life and the constellation of issues that can shape immigrant health. She was able to reveal that high blood pressure was not simply due to the result of individual lifestyle choices, such as poor diet and physical inactivity, but rather the result of chronic stress with finding stable employment. That non-adherence to prescription medication wasn't due to forgetfulness or a failure to take responsibility for health, but rather an inability to afford out-of-pocket prescription medication costs. With the power of language translation, my mother was able to make visible the often invisible social determinants of health. So while my mother was notorious for being the go-to healthcare translator in our community, I began to think about the immigrants who needed help outside of our neighborhood, outside of Vancouver, and how about the rest of Canada? What was being done to address a problem so pervasive in healthcare? Motivated to overcome the challenge of language barriers in healthcare, I co founded Valentia Healthcare Translation with Rhea Verdi, whom I met in my research methods class during the height of the pandemic. Despite only interacting through Zoom, we formed an instant connection. And together, we built a team of 30 bilingual student volunteers providing free healthcare translation services for immigrants and newcomers all across Greater Vancouver. We've expanded our reach to 40 clinics and 10 community centers, established partnerships with Success and Mosaic, two of the largest social, immigrant social service agencies in British Columbia. But enough about me talking about our work. In January, I rolled out a brief survey to all those we've helped, asking about their experience with our services. These are some of the responses we've received translated into English. I felt safe and comfortable knowing that the doctor was able to understand my concerns. The language interpreter was attentive to my unique needs. She really took the detail and time to thoroughly discuss the details of my care. And finally, with the help of my interpreter, I felt reassured and at ease. Language justice extends beyond the immediate clinical setting. 
most of the existing healthcare research have been done on populations that are weird, which stands for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic societies. And due to a lower English language proficiencies, many immigrants, newcomers, and refugees are underrepresented in population-based research studies. The unintentional exclusion of these groups threatens external validity, which is the ability to generalize research findings to other populations or settings. When a study's external validity is compromised by its sample, it's difficult to generalize research findings to other populations. A lack of diversity in research can lead to biased results that might not accurately reflect the experiences and the needs of certain populations. All in all, diversity is crucial to conducting impactful and socially relevant research. And with that being said, Valentia Healthcare Translation is proud to collaborate with the Clinical Research Department at BC Children's Hospital to improve the diversity of their research samples to include those with lower English language proficiency. Our work at Valentia is far from being done. In 2021, more than half a million Canadians cannot speak either of the official languages of English or French. And this data doesn't include permanent residents and those with non-status. But what's hopeful is that more than 40% of the Canadian population are bilingual. And at Valentia, we hope to inspire this 40% to step in and make a difference in their communities. I began my talk by painting a picture. Our neighbors gathered around our dining room table confiding in each other about their hardships navigating a new country and its healthcare system. But between these heavy and difficult conversations underlie a common thread of hope. Hope that by persevering and remaining resilient, they could build a better future for their children and many more generations to come. The hope for a better future is in our hands and it's up to each and every one of us to contribute to a safer, more inclusive, and more equitable future. Whether we're in healthcare, business, technology, or the arts, language justice is an essential part of achieving equity, diversity, and inclusion. Breaking down communication barriers not only enables people to effectively communicate with one another, it also promotes greater understanding empathy, and connection between people from different backgrounds. With the social and political divisiveness that has been exacerbated by COVID-19, it's more important than ever to make our different cultures a source of harmony and resilience and not discord and intolerance. Thank you so much. <laughs>